All right, so um, today, obviously, we've done static failure. Now what we're going to do is fatigue failure. This is what characterises you guys as a mechanical engineer from now on. Um, up to static failure, you're a civil engineer because it's not moving. Cool. Um, as of now, we start to talk about real things, machines that move, um, and static analysis doesn't work anymore. Um, so what we need to be able to do is work out how to analyse these things for fatigue, and fatigue is that repeat loading. So fatigue is a really interesting phenomenon. Um, fatigue effectively means that something will fail as a result of a repeated load at far less stress than static failure. So if your yield strength is 200 megapascals, you might apply a 20 megapascal stress cyclically and fail, even though you are, what did I say, 200? So a factor of 10 away from the yield stress. So fatigue failure can have a huge influence on failure or on, on the way that we design machines because that, that cyclic loading actually has a damaging effect. All right? So that cyclic loading can have a real detriment where if you just do a static analysis, you might say it's completely fine. Um, and so we need to understand the way that those loads cycle on and off of a machine component. And there are lots of different ways that loads can cycle on and off. All right? So I've got a few examples here. The first one, let's say this is stress, or it could be force or whatever, you know, force generally has a relationship to stress that's, if not linear, then close to it. Um, so we have tension here, compression here, and this is what we call a cyclic or a fully reversed stress. So you can imagine if you've got a bar and you put 100 megapascals on it this way and then release that and 100 megapascals in compression and release that. That's one full sine wave cycle. Okay? And so when we analyse these things, certainly initially we'll just be using nice sine waves or sinusoidal curves um, because that's easy for us to do. Um, but when you get more complicated things, and certainly using ANDES and that kind of stuff, you can actually use more complicated um, fatigue histories. So that's called fully reversed. This one's called fluctuating. All right, the difference is that the mean of that sinusoidal curve is not zero. You see the center of that curve is zero, so all positive, all negative. Here, we've got a non-zero mean. You might still have the same amplitude, but when the mean's non-zero, that actually has a different effect on the stress. So by having a fluctuating as opposed to fully reverse, that can be much, much worse as well. And we'll talk about both of these circumstances. Uh, one version of fluctuating is something called zero base. I haven't put it on this slide, but we'll talk about it. Zero base is basically where the bottom of that hits zero. All right, and so that's effectively all force on and then nothing. All force on and then nothing. And at that point, if I was to draw it on the board, and as I say, we'll talk about fluctuating later because it's more complicated than the fully reverse case. The fully reverse case is what we're going to do first. All right, so that's zero based. And if we look at that, all right, so if that's some sort of sigma, then you'll have your mean as sigma on two, and you'll have your amplitude as sigma on two as well. So the mean and amplitude are equal in that case. Right, and so that's going to be important for us, um, but I'll talk about why. So we've got cyclic or fully reversed, we've got fluctuating, and that's non-zero mean, and zero base is a special case of that. Uh, and then this is much closer to what we might actually see in a machine component, some sort of a spectrum of loading. Uh, we're not going to do this in this subject. Uh, you can do this exactly in ANTIS. So ANTIS will do the same calculations that we do for fatigue, in the background for us if we want to when we're doing finite elements. So it will do that for every single element. It will do a fatigue calculation. You need to understand how it's doing it because you've got to put a lot of information in to make it work. So we need to know all of this stuff. But you can do this and this in ANSYS. And what you can also do 
is take strain gauge data, actual historical data from a piece of equipment that looks like that, and put that into ANSYS as well. All right, and so people calculate that really effectively. Um, there's the back half, I think, of chapter eight of your textbook actually gives you the equations and theories as to how this actually works and how ANSYS and all any other code that does this type of thing works. You can do this by hand, it's a pain. Um, I'm not going to make you do it. Please read the back of the textbook though, because if you don't know, it's the rain flow analysis and that kind of stuff, all sorts of terms you're looking for. Um, it's, it's useful to be across it, uh, and most of the time you'll use a piece of software to calculate it, but in the absence of that, somewhere along the line, you might actually have to calculate it, and remember back to this class when I said it's in that chapter of the textbook, you'll have to go and dig it out and work it out yourself. Okay? So, that's for this case, this is much more realistic. We're going to approximate that with our sinusoidal curves, okay? And if I had this sort of case and I wanted to approximate it, I'd just take sort of a max and a min and a mean and just, you know, put some sort of curve. I get pretty close doing that, okay? So, you can, you can approximate real data with an idealised curve, at least in the first instance, and get a much quicker result. All right, and as I said, um, repeated levels of stress can cause failure at far less than your static yield stress. Right? And so that's what we need to be able to calculate. Now, the reason being is so uh, we all understand stress concentration. We all understand that a stress notch or something like this can cause there to be far greater stress in that local area than elsewhere. Um, now, stress concentration isn't just happening at notches. Uh, it can happen at you know, a lot of different types of features. And you have micro flaws of materials. I'll talk about that in a second. But effectively, stress concentration crack tips can cause fatigue failure. And we almost always see uh, a fatigue failure type plane occur from a stress concentration uh, when you have really good material. The reason being you have localized yielding. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, come back to that, actually. And the other one is micro flaws. So we might have localized yielding from the notch, and we might have localized yielding from the micro flaws. And so if you have a very small load, remember I was saying something maybe at 20 megapascals, where yield might be 200 megapascals. On the macroscopic level, you might be well under yield. But if you have a tiny little micro flaw, you might be over yield in that single little location. And that could be bad, uh, particularly if you keep loading on and off and on and off and on and off again. Okay? And I'll tell you why in a second. But so just think of materials, it's not just a matter of yield or not yield. You have all of this local microstructure that can actually cause localized yielding. Now, in static loading, it doesn't matter. You hit yield. It's fine, you hit yield, the rest of it is fine. Remember that curve, those, the curve that I showed for the static loading and why it, where a localized part of yield, it basically waits for everywhere else to hit yield as well before you have a problem for the material? That's not the case for fatigue, okay? So that's why stress concentration is very important for fatigue. Micro flaws are very important for fatigue. All right, so if we have stress concentration and we're hitting yield, very, very bad. If we have micro flaws hitting you, very, very bad. And what results is things like this. This is a very, very large roller. I don't remember whether it's actual road, like an actual steamroller type deal, or whether it was, I think it might actually be a roller for like crushing in the mill. Have you ever seen? So basically you crush the sugar cane between two big steel rollers like this. That's a guy's hand the tape measure, right? And this is the failure of a considerable shaft. Yeah? So this shaft is a big roller, two bearings, force up in the middle of it, and so you've got bending, and as that shaft rotates around, you've got tension at the top, compression at the bottom, and then the bit of material at the bottom comes back around at the top again, and it's tension. So effectively going from tension to compression, tension to compression at each piece of the material. And you can see, this is another diagram of that, there was actually a step in that shaft there, and at the very tip of that stress concentration, that's where the cracks started propagating. And this is an FEA model that, um, I think it might have been Rockfield did, um, to actually work out 
uh, whether the loading history and whether the fatigue was actually enough to cause that cracking or whether something else was at play. And sure enough, they were able to simulate that, simulate a crack tip and watch that crack tip propagate all the way through to the centre very, very slowly. Um, and so you'd be able to prove that it was that stress concentration that was causing the fatigue failure and that whatever they had analysed, they missed something in the in initial analysis of that shark. And in some circumstances, if you've got really old gear, it might not have been analysed for fatigue or it might have just been a static thing if it's you know, 50 years old, um, different practices back then, that sort of thing. Why does it look like low stress concentration on that? Uh, because that's a crack, right? And so that's actually not connected to that. So it would have been high before the crack. It would have been high, exactly. So the crack actually causes a massive stress concentration at the crack tip, and the act of cracking relieves the stress in the in the material as it moves down. So there's no way that that material can hold that material because it's broken. Yeah. So there's no connection there, so there'll be no stress there. The stress then reroutes down past that concentration and it gets worse and worse and worse until the tipping point, which is once the actual area here, so you've got a certain amount of loading, right? And as that crack propagates, once that area, force on area, meets ultimate tensile strength, you'll just have static failure at that point. So the crack propagation will either happen for a very short amount of time or a very long amount of time, but the actual, the instantaneous catastrophic failure happens via static failure. But you get there because that crack propagating decreases your area until you meet the right criteria. So that's effectively what they're modeling there. Right, and so this is what's happening. It can be happening on microfloor, it can be happening at a stress concentration, it can be happening at any sort of geometry where you have that localised plastic deformation. Uh, let's say that this is, you know, our you know, Young's modulus yield, this is our plastic zone up to ultimate tensile. Ductile material, we've got a nice little stress concentration here, and at our stress concentration, we've got localised yielding. So at that point, we've got up to here and it's had some sort of a plastic deformation go on. Now we take that load off, and this curve recovers back down, you recover the elastic bit, you're left with some sort of plastic deformation. And then as you reapply that load, so reapply the load just normally to the whole component, in the local area that loads back up and you might creep a little bit further along that curve depending on how that load redistributes and what sort of a force you're putting on it and that kind of thing. And then you keep moving down until you get to the point where you've cycled it enough that in the local region you've hit ultimate. And at ultimate, the atoms or the crystalline structure or whatever you want to talk about lets go. It fails. It doesn't fail the whole thing, it just fails just a little bit. Just until you get back over this material that hasn't been in that plastic zone or hasn't met the ultimate criteria yet. And then you go back to the beginning. And back at the beginning, the new zone, you've got a new localised area, you've got new plastic, and that might actually happen over one cycle, or it might happen over multiple cycles. So this could just easily happen over one cycle, but it only cracks through the little plastic zone. If you've got a tiny, tiny microscopic plastic zone, you've only got a tiny little bit of crack, and then on the next application, the tip of that crack will get to ultimate, and so that's how that it creeps along. So it can either happen in you know, phases like this or ultimate, ultimate, ultimate just on that little zone. But that, that's how the crack grows. And the crack just grows slowly and it'll grow, grow more and more rapidly because remember we're decreasing the area. So as you decrease the area, you increase the stress. Um, and bang. As I said, this is going to happen at micro floors. So this is why any sort of a well that's done on a, a machine component that's going to have fatigue loading um, particularly if it's a critical component, we'll have x-rays done to make sure there's no bubbles and crap in the actual well because this is why. So if you have that stuff, you've got fatigue loading immediately. Wings of aircraft, we're all very comfortable in so much as they get um, x-rayed. Um, I'm quite happy for my entire airplane to be x-rayed um, because of this um, and so forth. And as I said, you know, it, it's a notch or a micro floor. Now the funny thing about this crack propagation is it actually gives us a tool to be able to work out uh, where the fatigue started and sometimes what type of fatigue might have actually resulted. Right? I've got a few images up here. Um, but the way I was describing it, those couple of different phases of failure actually present themselves in a failure plane. So when you look at something that's broken, and this 
speaks to root cause analysis, you go out to a plant, a bit of machinery or something, it's broken, you need to firstly fix it real quick and secondly work out why it broke so you can prevent it happening again because you might be move, losing millions of dollars a day. This is a really good place to start looking at why things fail. So if you have a really, really rough kind of surface on everything, chances are that was static failure. Because when things fail, by static I mean you hit ultimate everywhere. You just exceed the floor on area and the whole thing's just gone bang. You have a really uneven, jagged, rough surface when that happens because the whole material just tears itself apart. Okay? So if you have a failure that's all rough and shitty everywhere, chances are it was static and chances are someone did something stupid and put too much force on it or you know, just opened it up and, and it just broke. Right? You can tell that straight away. Um, if you're going to see something with actual fatigue failure, there will be some zone of that crack propagation which tends to be smooth and some zone of that rough area which is where the total area that's still carrying the load has has decreased to a point that you've hit that static value criteria. Okay? And so this is a few examples of things. So if you have a shaft, you might have some sort of a smooth zone coming from a particular point and then rough. Here's a couple of examples. This is like a hex bar. And so here's a nice smooth area that's propagated out from here and then you've got the roughness. So that tells us that we've got fatigue. It tells us that fatigue's originated down here. And maybe that's a, a geometric issue that you need to deal with. Maybe it was a flaw in the material. Maybe there was the material was initially right and then you got some sort of a dent or bang or crack or something like that in it. So someone hit it with something and that tiny little notch was enough to initiate this. But it gives you a point to start looking for, for where, where something's happened. This is a circular shaft. And once again, you can see the initial really nice smooth zone. And sometimes you've got three zones, so you've got a nice smooth zone, and then when things start picking up the pace, uh, slightly more rough, and when things just go catastrophically, it's, it's that really static failure rough surface. And here's another one. This one's really nice. Um, so you can see smooth region, a rougher region, and then the overload region where it's just gone. And this would be some sort of a, a believe it, a higher tensile steel. Oh, given that small, yeah, maybe, maybe it would be ducked off. Yeah, it'd probably go a lot earlier if it was high tensile, but it's a lovely smooth shape, so I, I think. Yeah, it's, it's the sort of material you want. That's only letting go with when it's still only holding by that much. That's actually quite a under, over specified in terms of material, or it's a really good material. Alright, so. The other thing you can do is work out a couple of different ways that these, these things might actually propagate. So if it's coming from one place, chances are you're, you're just loading you know, uh, in line. So for example, something like that, you're just loading, probably bending, open, close, open, close, and just on one point it's actually started propagating from. Um, the other thing is if you have just a smooth surface, so that might just be a bar, Alright, so there's no obvious notch. It's probably come from a, a, a flaw in the material. And it'll generally look like it's got sharp edges there. And this is tension compression, so either the, the whole thing, tension compression or bending. Um, and if you have a notch, then you'll have a smoother edge like that because it'll actually... Um, because it'll actually meet with that notch and that notch will actually cause that stress concentration. Um, so, tension, single deflection bending, so that's what I was saying. Reverse bending, and then rotating bending. So, single deflection bending would be tension, nothing, tension, nothing, tension, nothing. So, you come from one side. Reverse bending would be tension, compression, tension, compression. So, it grows from both sides. And then rotating bending, depending, so if it's very, very smooth, it's probably just a result of a floor somewhere. But if there's a notch on it, rotating bending will come from all sides because as that whole thing rotates, every bit of material goes in tension, compression, tension, compression, tension, compression. So it's going to grow evenly from all, all sides if you have a crack and you have forces that are going to exceed things. Now that's for high normal stress. So for high normal stress, you'll have a small zone of the smooth you know, crack growth and then a large zone of the rough crack because if you've got high stress, then you only need to decrease your area by a little bit to get into that, you know, that danger zone. If you've got low nominal stress, chances are you'll see a much, much larger 
um, smooth crack propagation zone and a much, much smaller rough critical um, phase plane. Right, so this is just a few examples. There's lots of other examples for other geometry. But as soon as you see a failure surface, it's not just that's broken. You as engineers can be working out why is it broken? Is it fatigue? Is it static loading? Where does it come from? Has it been a result of one dimension of bending or two dimensions of bending or rotational bending? Has it come from a notch? Is it even? Or has it come from a material discontinuity? Was it there initially or did someone whack it with something? You know, you can, you can diagnose a lot by just looking at a broken bit of gear. Um, and once you start understanding the ways that things fail, then it becomes a very effective technique. Alright, so, having said that, we need to be able to do calculations to avoid it, right? Um, and we can avoid static failure, we know that kind of stuff, um, but what we really need to do is to be able to come up with some sort of an analysis technique that's relatively efficient, it's relatively straightforward, that we can actually calculate these things. Um, now, there's a few different ways that we could do this. Um, one is experimentation. So we can either experiment on the actual thing we're interested in and bend it until it breaks, and then we know that you know when it's going to break. That's obviously not an efficient way of doing it. There's empirical data, um, and so that's generally what we would use, which is an idealised test, and then we take that test data and fit it to whatever we got. That's what we use for static fatigue. So that's kind of empirical data. You stretch, you get SY, and you apply it to yours. You don't know whether yours is exactly that, but plus or minus a, a certain factor is going to apply. So what we're actually going to do is use empirical data and then modify it to whatever our particular circumstance is. So we need to get the empirical data. Um, you guys all know about nice tensile tests. We can get SY and SUT from the tensile test and that nice long curve. Um, fatigue testing is much more difficult, um, obviously, because you need to cycle it. Um, and when we're talking about steel, oftentimes you need to have a million cycles. If you're talking about aluminium, you might need 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9 cycles just to get a single data point. Right, so think about, for a second, 10 to the, 10 to the 9 cycles. So that load goes on, load goes off, load goes on, load goes off. And how time consuming that would be if you don't have good test apparatus. But fortunately, because of that bending thing that I was talking about, you know, if you have a shaft and you start rotating it, uh, we can rotate shafts very, very quickly. If we put a bend, bit of bending on a shaft, we can rotate that very quickly and get a lot of cycles in a short period of time. And the type of test that we use in that respect is called an RR or rotating bending or rotating mini fatigue test. Right. And the way it works is if we get a test sample, and we have a really highly polished finish so that you know, obviously you don't have any roughness or notches or anything like that that's going to cause the fatigue to happen prematurely. And you have this large radius here so that there's no notch, but you know full well it's going to fail in that centre section there. So that's about the radius and there's an Australian, at least an Australian, if not an international standard for you know, what the actual profile needs to be. But that profile's been calculated such that the stress concentration isn't in Right. So whatever that radius is, is about the amount of radius that you need for the force lines to be nice and evenly distributed. Alright, so we know it's going to occur there. And then what we do is put a little bit of bending on it and spin it around. Alright, and so um, effectively at the top point or at any point in the material, when it's, you know, you bend it that way, when it's at the top it's in compression, as it moves around it's in tension, as it moves around it's in compression again. And so you have a perfect you know, sinusoidal curve as that thing spins around. Right. And this is generally what it looks like. You have some sort of a, a motor and some bearings and a weight in the middle and you bend it. And you bend it by different amounts. I think I've got a video here. Let's have a look at the video first. Alright, so this is a real test apparatus. You can see You've got motors, you're spinning the shaft, and the actual the equipment can apply. See this? 
the top end there, that's like the Instrum tensile test is pushing down. So you can apply a set load to it. You understand exactly what the bending load is, so you can calculate exactly what sigma x as a result of MC on I is. And so you know what the positive and negative values of stress are for a given load. And so effectively what we do, if you get a brand new piece of material, you put a set load on it, and that's going to be set sigma x, and you spin it till it breaks. And then you count n. You count the number of revolutions at breaking point, you put a new bit of material in there, you put a new load on, just a little bit more load, and you spin it till it breaks. And this is what you get. Okay? So S is the stress sigma x that's, you know, top and bottom, positive sigma x, negative sigma x, positive sigma x again. And N is the number of cycles that failure occurred at. So if sigma x is SUT, <coughs> if we've just bent it, effectively if you get one rotation you're lucky because you've just bent it to the point of failure. So bang, zero cycles. All right. Tiny, 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 a little bit less than ultimate. Down, you might get one rotation, dead, right? A little bit less again, you might get, you know, what's that, 10 to 1, so that's 10 cycles by about that much. Again, you decrease load, you get 100 cycles, decrease load, and so forth. You get all the data points on this curve, and this is called an SN curve, and this is effectively characterising the fatigue endurance of a, a, a material, right? So this curve is really, really useful to us. Um, yeah, anything less than 10 to 3, so anything just the log scale again, we talked about log scales. Anything less than 10 to 3, so that's less than a thousand cycles, is called uh, low cycle fatigue. And generally speaking, that means that straight out of the box you're going to get plastic deformation somewhere, and it's just applying load to that plastic deformation. So if you did a static calculation, you're probably in the plastic zone at an option or something like that. And so you might get up to a thousand cycles on something like that, probably less. And if you're comfortable with the hundred cycles on a bit of gear, um, then you know you can save a lot of material doing that. Um, in this middle sort of zone, you got high cycle fatigue, um, anywhere between about a thousand and about a million. And the really interesting thing with steels, and the reason we build basically everything out of steel, is that ten to the six, this line goes straight. What that means is, is if I have designed it such that my load, my cyclic load is less than either SE dash or SU dash, I think the textbook uses, so that's largely what I use in the rest of the notes. If my, for my stress is about here, it means I can, I can apply that stress cyclically for infinite numbers of cycles, for infinite life. Think of the number of What's, what's the maximum revolutions per minute that your car's engine can run at? 6,000? 7,000? 8,000 if you really don't like it or it's a really good car. <laughs> um, the, the Formula SAE engine, 600cc Honda CDR 600, um, I think that red line's about 13,000 RPM. Right, so that's revolutions per minute, so that's... So we're talking 13,000 cycles in a minute in that engine. Yeah. Um, now, you want to ride that motorbike for, well, until you crash into something, probably. Um, but let's let's say 10 years. 15 years, is that a good lifespan for a motorcycle? I don't know, I don't know any motorcycle. But you'd like to get 20 years out of the car, and then almost that, that amount of revolution. So, um, let's say 15 years of riding for an hour a day to and from work, that's 60 times 14,000 times 365 times the 15 years you want to ride it for. It's a lot of cycles, right? And it's a hell of a lot more than 10 to the 6, right? So that's why engine componentry and pistons and you know shafts and things like that are made out of steel. Because steel is really nice in that respect. And so what we're going to do is pretty much everything we calculate, we're going to calculate for infinite life. So we need to know this point, this curve itself doesn't really matter. What matters is the value of S at this point, at 10 to the 6 for steel. And what we call that is either SE or SN, I think um, the textbook uses, and dash if it's from the RR or rotating bending test. The dash just tells us from that. So I put SN here, I think it's 
SSE in the PDF that went up a couple of days ago, but I've just updated it. It doesn't matter. It, SE or SN is used depending on which textbook you use. Um, but the endurance limit SN dashed generally indicates that it's from the bending test. And that's the value. That's our characteristic value. So before we had an SY, now we have SN. Now, here's a few different types of materials. So non-ferrous materials are a little bit different. So ferrous materials, so that's our steels, they're great. 10 to the 6 we're sweet. All right? You only need to do a test up to 10 to the 6, and it's good forever if you test for that. Um, different types of materials uh, have different types of light. So here's our 10 to the 6. We're talking about, what are we talking about here? Non-ferrous materials, so things like ions and um, aluminium and things like that. This one's representative aluminium alloys. So a few different types of aluminium, raw, permanent mold cast and sand cast it. But you see at 10 to the 6, you're still going down by quite a lot. Right, so aluminium doesn't have that endurance limit. Aluminium just keeps it going down and down and down. Now it does tend to sort of plateau off. It's still going down, but this is a log scale, so this is a lot of cycles per section then, from then on. And it's going reasonably horizontal at 10 to the 8. So we generally use 10 to the 8 as our design criteria for aluminium. Right? Requires a lot more testing, obviously. Um, but if you have that sort of SN, SN calculated at 10 to 8, so that would just be the, the S value at 10 to the 8. That's what we use in our fatigue calculations. Do the dotted line, uh, lines mean it wasn't tested? Uh, yeah, possibly. This is, this is our textbook, so I, I don't have any background for where the actual testing was done. It's sort of more indicative, but yeah, by the looks of it, that's, that's what I'd assume. Because you can, you can basically, I mean, if you test it then, you know full well that that's that's an SUT and it's going to fail land, so you just draw a straight line. It's not that not that critical in that zone. All right, so um, who has done an RR wall bending test in the lab before? No, me neither. Who has ever seen an RR wall bending test other than the YouTube video I showed? No. Um, so generally speaking. When you're running that sort of test, that's really, really pricey lab gear, and there might be a couple of labs in Australia. So, and the other thing is, think of how many samples you need. So you probably want a uh, hundred points on that curve. Except each of those points, you might want three to five tests to be statistically accurate. Um, so we're talking a hell of a lot of material, a hell of a lot of time, and tens of thousands of dollars. Maybe, maybe if you've got a material, a new material you want to test, you might be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars testing. Right? It's not feasible to you know, fix something at the Wilma Mill for hundred thousand dollars just to get it done. Right? So that's, that's not feasible unless you're Holden or Ford or Ferrari or someone like that designing new materials and you really, really want to know what the material property is because you're about to sell hundred thousand cars. Right, so what we need is a way to get approximate data. Now, there are people that investigate this stuff, so there's textbooks and all sorts of things online with this data for particular types of materials. Uh, this curve here is a, an approximation to that previous um, curve that, that I showed. So it's an approximation to this. And the approximation is, well, at 10 to the 0, it intercepts an SUT, we know that. So it's jumping forward to this 10 to the 3, so up the low side of the T, straight line, you effectively join SUT up to this point. And this top line is the one we're interested in, this is the bending line, so this is equivalent to that RR more bending test. At that point, if we know SUT or SU, the point on this curve is approximately 0.9 times that. So if I want the low cycle fatigue limit, and I know my ultimate, which I can do from static testing, it will be approximately 0.9 times that will be the point on this curve, which is it's good. That, that's good to know. Now, plus or minus a little bit, we have factors of safety and things to deal with that. That's useful if I'm talking about low cycle T. Straight line joining it up for my 10 to the 6, my infinite life endurance limit. And that SN or SN dash in this case is approximately 0.5 times SUT. <coughs> Right, so your ultimate tensile strength, about half that is equivalent to SD or SN. Um, and that's really useful to us. So that's the number that we use. 
Um, we need to modify that. I'll talk about that. Um, but that 0.5 SUT is quite important. Now your textbook puts these other lines there and it's kind of confusing. Um, different textbooks do fatigue in different ways uh, and they're all a little bit, they try to be general but they're, they're actually confusing. So what I'm actually doing this year is changing the way that um, we lay these things out in class and I'm going to explain things hopefully a little bit better um, than what the textbook does. Um, they have a few different values. So for example, this line is the axial line and this line is the torsion line. All right? And so they actually mix some things up in this. Um, so one thing, the difference between the bending line and the axial line is if you have that axial force applied in tension and compression and tension and compression, what you actually find is that you get failure sooner than you do if you do a bending test under the same level of you know, stress or the failure, yeah, so your ultimate is lower so effectively for the same point you failed earlier, right? Now the reason for that is where the actual critical zone is, alright? So I've got some examples here, so in rotating bending our critical zone is around the outside edge, right? That's where we're going to fail. So if that thing's rotating around, the maximum stress happens at the outside, where R is the greatest, remembering MC, or where C is the greatest, MC or I. So it happens at the outside, so that's the maximum. So we've got some sort of an area just on the outside edge where that stress is maximum. For axial loading, the stress is maximum everywhere. And remember what we said is causing fatigue. In the absence of a notch, it's a micro form. And so if you have a particular bit of material, same size, but for bending, the maximum stress is only occurring just around the outside edge. Whereas for axial loading, the maximum stress is occurring everywhere. The probability of you hitting one tiny little micro floor when the maximum stress is everywhere is higher than the probability when you've only got just around the outside. Okay, so the probability is higher that you're going to hit a micro floor with axial loading, and that's why what we see when we actually test the stuff, we see a less endurance limit in axial loading. All right? And it's less by about 0.9. So that's, that point there is 0.9 times that point, which is 0.9 times S dash N, which is 0.9 times 0.5, which is 0.45 SN. And so that's what that line is. Now we're not going to use that in our analysis, we are going to use this 0.9 factor uh, in uh, uh, size factor that we're going to use, but I'll talk about that in the next lecture. So that's where that 0.9 comes from and I'll refer back to this, but we're just going to ignore that line because we're going to use more than my system anyway. And the bottom line is torsion, so if you just have pure torsion, the actual shear stress so tau, xy, or whatever that you actually measure will be less than this by a factor of 0.58. And that's actually just exactly what we expect from the relationship with one of my um, And I'll just put something up on the board just to, I guess, emphasize that, and then we'll call it a day. That was Okay, so that 0.577 or whatever it is, 0.58. If I had a torsional, or well, let's say I have a bar. Oh, firstly, there's no difference between bending and torsion in terms of the probability of hitting a micro floor because torsion is around the outside, about the same proportion as bending is around the outside. So there's no factor that you need to change to that. There's just a factor relation relating between shear stress and normal stress if this is measured in shear strength, which is why I hate this curve. See, so there's, there's actually more than just one idea going on in this curve. It's in your textbook, and so I'm going to explain it, particularly because the, the actual process, the analysis that the textbook uses, has a load factor, which is that 1.9 and 0.58. We're not going to use that, but if you refer back to the textbook and ignore my notes in 10 years, it's useful to have at least a bit of a background about where that comes from. So that's why I'm talking. Okay, so in torsion, let's say we have T and T goes like that. T 
T goes on, T goes off. All right, we have some element on the side here, and that's got torsion on it, tau xy. All right, so tau xy is what's being read over there at failure. All right, so that's that's SN shear or whatever you want to call it. All right. Now, if we only had the RR more bending result, we could work out what the failure in pure torsion or what the value of Txy is at failure based on a von Weiss's relationship. Okay? And that is effectively, we know the equation for von Weiss's equals sigma x squared plus 3 tau xy squared, right? We don't have a sigma x in this case. So that equals tau xy squared. And square square rooted effectively equals root 3 tau xy. Right, so let's say that I know this, I've just measured it in an experiment, I know that, I want to know its relationship back to von Weiss's, so I take that on the other side, 1 on root 3, sigma dash, equals tau xy. Anyone got a calculator?
Okay, so tutorial Monday, um, the first hour will be a lecture on this, and then the second hour will be you guys actually doing this in an example. Um, I'm not sure whether I'll make that video or not, but, but we'll talk about that. I'll send you that later. Uh, um, anyway. And then we have an SN, and we just use it. If we have fully reverse loading, and it's fully reverse between positive bombices and negative bombices, then our factor of safety is just SN divided by bombices. Right, so it's identical to our, our yield equation, except we're using SN and uh, repeating bombices rather than SY and a static bombices. Easy enough? Um, we'll do more complicated stuff, obviously, but um, I'll talk about all this in the next tutorial.